This is a warning to all living mortals that on the 13th of December, Moose will release 13 of the most terrifying interviews of horror unto the world. That's right, 13 brand new episodes in the month of December leading up to our season premiere. And until then, Horror Hounds, mash on. Christmas, Moose brings to me the horrifying season premiere. Welcome to season four with our special guest from Stephen King's Sleepwalkers and Leo from Charmed, Brian. Kraus. Hello, Horror Hounds, and welcome to the 13th horrifying day of Christmas. I'm your host, Moose, and this is the season four premiere of Moose's Monster Mash. And I, God, I couldn't think of a better guest. He, today's guest, checks all the boxes. Actor, director, producer, podcast host, and... I mean, who else can say they got to interview an angel for their Christmas episode? So, from Sleepwalkers, Charmed, and everything in between, please welcome Mr. Brian Krause. Woo, 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 thank you. <laughs> What's That's up, Moon? Thanks for having me on, man. Oh, thank you. And yeah, I, I, I think I definitely need, you know, the uh, like audience button. Because uh, I feel like after that build-up, there needs to be like an applause or something. <laughs> oh, just like one in the background, you know that. Like... <laughs> Yay! Yay! <laughs> you know, make it like a mom voice, you know. Go get him, honey! <laughs> I'm so proud of you! <laughs> that would be epic, actually. <laughs> so how's life treating you? you know, how's, how's everything going? You know, it's uh, it's going all right. Um, you know, I, I'm not unlike anyone else. Uh, you know, the last couple of years have been a challenge. Uh, you know, and I think we're all kind of coming out of this thing. You know, hopefully with a better idea of ourselves and uh, the world around us, and uh, you know, uh, ready to be social again, and you know, all of it. Um, so. It's 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 good. I'm in a good space. I, I wound up moving last year, and you know, I'm going to change a life like so many people have, uh, and it's good. I'm, I'm first time ever. Uh, if the pandemic did anything good for Hollywood, it was we don't have to self tape. I mean, we don't have to be in the room anymore. Everything is self taped so you could literally be in Greece or anywhere in the world, and you just you record on your phone and you send it in. So. That's allowed me for the first time to actually not have to be in Hollywood or near it or, you know, Los Angeles, Southern California. So I decided, uh, you know, take a chance and move somewhere else that might be a little more, I guess, fun and relaxing. And I don't know. We're six months in, so. (laughs) (laughs) So, I mean, yeah, you, you finally get to, you know, audition from pretty much wherever you want. And then, yeah, if you get the role, you have to fly out. But, right. you know, it's not like you, you have to, not like it was even five years ago where you're beating down the doors and it's like, well, there's an audition for this movie. Be there at six o'clock or lose it. You know, it's... Right, or have no chance. Yeah. And, you know, you kind of, as if you were an actor, you had to be in New York or Los Angeles. And mostly Los Angeles. You had to be there because, exactly, on a Thursday at six, you... 
you know, need to be at this street and this street, and there's your opportunity, and and that doesn't exist anymore, uh, which is which is kind of freeing, you know, first time in 35 years that uh, I don't have to live in Los Angeles, and uh, you know, I tell you, with the cost of living and the traffic and everything else that is LA right now, it's uh, it's nice to get out for a little bit. Well, and I say, and I think it opens it up for more people to audition for some of these roles because you're not confined just to those major cities. You know, you can find some schmuck in, you know, I don't know, Madison, Wisconsin. (laughs) Where do schmucks live? (laughs) Right. (laughs) Not to say that, you know, everybody in Madison, Wisconsin is a schmuck, but there might be a schmuck in Madison, Wisconsin who says, I want to audition for that role. Now has the opportunity. And, it's it opens up the world of acting for more people who want to get into it so it is a nice it is the one benefit one of the few benefits that came out of this whole pandemic and lockdown and it's definitely a change for the better i think so and i i don't know that it goes back i mean when you look at the cost of getting an, an office space uh hiring the casting director to be there every day the assistant uh getting all your producers to drive across town at a certain hour and traffic and gas. And I, I don't think they ever go back to it. I mean, maybe on a big, big, you know, role for a, you know, some Marvel movie or, you know, the lead role on a TV show, you might come in. But, you know, most of the stuff I've seen, people are just getting cast right off the table. I say, yeah, when you can just fire off an email and be like, all right, I like this guy. What are your thoughts? Boom. So, and, you know, just keep sending it down the line. Yeah. You, you're just... A roll's just a click away. So, yeah, I'm, you know, where do I want to live next? I wish, <laughs> I, wish I could afford Hawaii. <laughs> Madison, Wisconsin. You can go hang out with the schmuck. <laughs> I like Madison. <laughs> I do, too, it's actually. It's there for me, but I, I do enjoy it. I do, too. I, I've made a few trips up there. I love Madison. Like, What got you interested in acting? Because now, like, I know before you were an actor, you, you were like, a handyman and you did like you you you, you it's funny because looking into your history you did essentially the like stereotypical work leading up to being an actor there was like server and handyman and all this to and then actor so it's like every time you know, and when i say stereotypical it's like every time you see somebody on tv like oh i want to be an actor okay what restaurant do you work at you know right. <laughs> it, right. that sort of thing so what was the trading like what was the trade off point to say yep this is the route I want Well it, it's a long story I, I guess through high school I had started taking a, an acting film acting class and my goal was to play soccer and go to UCLA and get a degree in sports medicine and you know see if that happens uh see if I could be a professional one way or the other and you know after a year of community college I was kind of like I, I had already known I wanted to do acting in a little bit. I didn't know it was my career yet through high school, but I knew I wanted to star in a feature film. Like Whether that mean do it for life or yet, I kind of hadn't made that decision. And then after a year of community college and playing soccer in the late 80s, I realized, uh, you know, I wasn't that good. <laughs> and... Uh, you know, to get into sports medicine and be a doctor was, you know, a six, eight, ten year commitment. And uh, I was living in Orange County, which is about an hour south of L.A. So I was able to drive up and do auditions through high school. And, you know, my proximity to Los Angeles was an hour. So it was it was attainable if I wanted to try it. I didn't have to do this whole move across the country. So in between that year of before I went into my second year that summer, I was like, you know what? I'm not going to be a professional soccer player. School's going to take forever. You know, why don't I give it a go? And I had I had gained a little weight, so I wasn't like this scrawny little guy anymore. I was, you know, I was a young 19-year-old athlete and kind of built out. So I, I started getting callbacks, which I had never done from when I was 16 to 19. Like, go in one, see you later, okay. And, and never even came close to sniffing and getting a job. But all of a sudden, I was getting these callbacks. I'm like, you know, maybe I take a year and see. Let's just let's just take this year, and if something starts to develop, I'll know whether I need to go back to school or if I should attack this. So 
I went and got a, I, I was valet parking cars and I got a job as a bellman at the Marriott Suites in Newport. And so I could work any, any time I wasn't working, I was driving to LA, dropping pictures off, or I was going to classes and just, you know, 24 hours a day, like making this loop and, and going. And, uh, within, within that first year, so once I first committed to myself, I, I guess I was 19, I was like, I'm doing this. And that was, Probably June or July of '88, uh, and then within that year, 1988, '89, I got my SAG card. I did a McDonald's commercial, a couple of commercials. Uh, I had a couple lines: one in Highway to Heaven, one in uh, Baywatch, the pilot of Baywatch, uh, which Majin Amick uh, was the guest star of the week in the pilot. And so I said my very one line to Majin. Uh, who I would wind up working with, you know, a couple of years later. Um, so at the end of that year, I had a teensy little resume of a couple of commercials and a few one-liners. And I was like, I am a star. I can do this. So I decided to take another year off and I was still working at the hotel. And I started missing more because I was working more. But uh, I, I'd say it was the summer of 88. I really said, I'm going to give this a go. And, you know, I gave up everything. I wasn't hanging out with my friends. I wasn't going out drinking or partying or anything. It was full time. I'm going to give this the full commitment, the full treatment. Every day I wake up and it's all I thought about. It's all I wanted to do. And, um, you know, I believed I could do it a lot more than I could actually do it. And I think that blind confidence <laughs> without ability even be talent you know and it's like i think i my confidence was much greater than my talent and you know sometimes confidence wins out and this is something i've learned in life as well and it's proven itself over and over it's it's not always the most competent that you know gets the job or gets the spot on the team or whatever it's the one that believes the most um you know and for everybody out there i mean it's it's confidence and just you know, I, I kind of convinced myself that I could do this, and then you know, hopefully my talent is slowly caught up to it. <laughs> you know, because I'm not confident at all anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not all the talent. <laughs> it's kind of flipped. It's it's funny. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it worked because after bouncing around on TV shows, I mean, you had an American Summer in '90, and then '91. Three movies. Four movies. Yeah, so 1988, The American Summer with uh, Mike Landis, who I actually I grew up with. Uh, we went to the same high school, whatever. We, we just met on an audition and realized we lived a few miles apart. Um, <clears throat> and that came out that next year, Brian Austin Green. And, and then, yeah, it was 1990 we filmed uh, Return to the Blue Lagoon. Um, so, you know, it was, it was very fast from when I decided... I'm going to do this, and I am going to star in a feature film starring Brian Krause. Like, that was my main goal, my goal. I'm going to star in a studio film. Like, this is, this is what I'm doing, this is what I'm doing. And in two years, uh, two and a half years, it happened. And, uh, you know, from small part to small part, and, and I tell you, it, it doesn't happen, it's not supposed to happen like that. <laughs> but, but, uh, you know, I, I don't know that I was really ready for it. I, I didn't have a plan after that. You know, I, I hadn't planned for a career or how to accept, you know, fame that came with it and success and the the movies I was going in for. And, you know, it, it came on. I wasn't quite mature enough and ready for it. Uh, you know, when I see actors come along now and, you know, one that really strikes who's, you know, been doing this forever is Leonardo DiCaprio, who started so young, mm -hmm. uh, you know, 14, 12, 13, 14. And for him to maintain his composure and go forward and art and, you know, he was, he stayed out of the bullshit and really made something out of it and showed a lot of maturity. Uh, and, and I don't think that happens all the time for, you know, young actors that, that get it at the end of their teenage, um, early twenties, it's, you know, you can really become, uh, <laughs> fully yourself and think life is oh, yeah. you know, too easy. Right. 
Well, and you had another uh, thing to contend with at the same time. You, you, you were also a heartthrob. I mean, you had the looks, man. You know, it's funny, dude, because in high school, I was... Five foot nine, 142 pounds, geeky. I played the tenor sax. I was the smallest guy in a soccer team. I had no friends. I was in the drama club. Like, I was, I, I had a huffy, for Christ's sake. I was like, you know, <laughs> I was, I was a kind of a geek. And, it, you know, it was, you know, to, to think, you know, I wanted to date the cheerleaders and all these people. And then, you know, it was not happening. So, you know, when we get Blue Lagoon and all of a sudden I'm naked and, yeah, this heartthrob and sleep and all of a sudden it's like, ew, you're the hit guy. It's like, what? Like, where was that when I wanted it? That's not <laughs> me, right? Like, <laughs> at all. I wasn't the captain of the football team. Are you kidding me? Right. You know, yeah. jumping into Sleepwalkers, uh, in a lot of the scenes, you get a lot of, like, Bo Duke vibes. You know, especially when you're, you know, cruising like around in the Trans hair. Am. You know, I mean, yeah, it's the hair, it's the body, it's just the, the, the whole, like, machismo, but, just that feel. You know, and it's uh, like, no, nah, I could see it. That's funny. <laughs> I did watch a lot of Deuce of Hazard growing up, that's for sure. Yeah, and yeah, you can, you can definitely see there's, uh, whether it's intentional or not, there's some influence in, like, the way you carry yourself in some of those scenes. So it's like, no, it, it it works. Oh man, thanks. It was, uh, you know, yeah. So I guess I guess that's you know instant success, and then I mean not instant instant, but felt like it, right? And then you know to be thrust into the public eye as something that I never was growing up. You know, all of a sudden you're this sexy thing when you know you barely had sex yourself with anybody, and it's like you know it's like what like. You know, and then Facebook comes along, and all the cheerleaders are like, "Hey, Brian, what's up?" I'm like, oh, "Fuck off!" Like, it's like, "No, I wanted you back then, I'm damn it!" <laughs> <laughs> what? Get out of here! <laughs> it's kind of fun. Before we dive into Sleepwalkers, were you a fan of horror at all, or? Uh, you know, a little, kind of the comedy horror. I mean. Uh, werewolf in london type of thing I, i've watched a lot of uh twilight zone um anything too horry actually yeah I, I get scared uh scary movies are scary movies and, and they would uh i wouldn't consume them uh, as much as i i know a lot of friends did you know children of the corn all, all that stuff man it it gets I, listen i was like i still close my closet door at night because you know when i was seven i saw the dust particles in the sky and i was like there's something in there <laughs> so you know <laughs> like that movie uh the strangers you know mm-hmm. this is strangers yeah scott's been and uh lived I, dude i pace all the lights are on watching a movie like that Ooh. uh so I wasn't the biggest fan. I, when they added a little comedy to it, I was like, okay, I can get this, you know, and you get that slasher vibe in you know, some movies, and that's kind of, that's okay. But anything too, like, this is real or could be real or, you know, possession movies, no, nope, freak me out. No, I played the devil. I've, you know, I've done all these things. and uh, But to watch them, and even today, I get the lights are on, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, and let, let, let's talk uh, Sleepwalkers. It's your, uh, you know, journey into horror on the big screen, and you know, it's Stephen King. I mean, it, starting out in horror, it's probably one of the best places to start. And you, you play this heartthrob who uh, is also a cat person, but not a cat person. But the movie is amazing. I love the fucking movie. Uh, you're a shapeshifter. That's what it is. That's the word I was looking for. And you know, it's you, you and your mom, and you. Uh, it, the story revolves around you and this uh, girl in town. And it's the, the story's good. The, the the special effects are good, and it, it's just God. It is such a fun movie. 
what was Sleepwalkers like for you? You know, stepping into the role of the shapeshifter. You know, I had just done Blue Lagoon coming off of that, and then, you know, I was starting to go in for all the movies that were, you know, everything. And and that was like, oh, man, oh, me and you know, Jason London, I, who I was living with at the time, was like, dude, this is Stephen King movie, blah, blah, blah. You know, and we all had friends that were like, no, oh, Chris Young, or different actors. I was like, oh, did you go in for it? Did you go in for it? Oh, yeah, yeah, new Stephen King. So as the actors on the street, we had all known Hey, new Stephen King movie coming down the pipe, right? Mm -hmm. Like, get in on this bad boy. And, uh, you know, I started getting callbacks. And and then, you know, as it progressed and happened, uh, I mean, I just, it's Stephen King. I mean, late 80s, early 90s, he was still, he's the king. Oh, yeah. You know, know, to to sit and imagine, like, wow, I'm a piece of one of these is... is, uh, it was hard to wrap my head around it, um, you know, and then everybody that was on the movie, uh, you know, like I said, Majin, who was my co-star, uh, who I gave one line to in Baywatch, and they cut me out, and they kept her. <laughs> uh, you know, here I am starring next to her. Vindication! <laughs> uh, yeah, and it, was, it was, you know, and then Alice Krieg is so amazing, and Ron Perlman, and, you know, we had Luke Skywalker in there, it's, I, I was very much out of my element, uh, but I tell you, the, the great thing is Mick Garris, who is probably the sweetest man you ever meet on earth, and, and so kind and welcoming and uh, talented beyond belief. But you know, he brought me in under his wing, and uh, he championed me, and and you know, really made it work with me. And, and you know, I don't know that I was his choice. Remember his studio movie, so. He might have been handed me, and, you know, maybe I was his choice, maybe I wasn't. But, you know, I got to think he's, you know, dealing with a young actor who everybody on there has already done a television show or 50 movies, and here's this new kid. So, um, you know, he kind of brought me in and and made me feel welcome and belonged. And uh, it was, you know, I thought that was going to be life forever, you know. Every movie you make takes three, four months, and this is how you do it. And, uh, you know, <laughs> not necessarily the case, as we know, but, um, man, what an experience. Uh, you know, and Mick, I still run into him and talk to him here and there. I've seen Mansion a couple times, and uh, Pearlman, and, you know, as we do Comic Cons and stuff. And um, it was fun. I don't know how else to say it. It was like, you know, I had met with Alice, and we talked. We were talking about the character, um, and talked with Mick, and he very much liked the American Werewolf in London. Uh, that we have this. Yes, it's scary, but it's got to be this campy edge, oh, yeah. right? And so that's kind of how he described it. And then, and then talking with uh, Alice and how how she finds a character and lives it uh, was such a lesson. And, she brought me in too and worked together and it was a great acting experience. Um, just working with pros like that, you know, uh, Ernie Lively. Um, I mean, it was, it was awesome. It, you know, and it set me up. I mean, here I am 30 years later and people still watch it and, uh, mm-hmm. you know, and, and I think that helped later on get charmed and everything else I've done that, you know, I'm lucky so early I started a, a studio film. Um, you the know, studio and, film, like you said, it's Stephen King. I mean, that that automatically gives it legs. I'm proud of it for sure. Uh, the Blue Lagoon and and Sleepwalkers. It's it's probably my greatest uh, acting moment. Right, three thousand theaters. We opened number one. It didn't stay there very long, but it. Uh, but hey, uh, it opened. You know. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's to not, all the yeah, cheerleaders in high school, right here, motherfucker. Yeah, you know, it, it, it's not how long you stay at number one. It's like, did you make number one? Yeah, and so yeah, you made it. You know, and and I, it is, it filled up my ego quite a bit, and um, you know, I I had a little bit of a hard time after that for the next year or two of you know finding my place in the industry, uh, finding another goal. I mean, what do you do? You're 22 years old and you just, you, you, you set a goal and you reached it. Now what? Now what? Have a fucking beer. Right. <laughs> yeah. 
have 50 of them. <laughs> so you, you just knocked out number one movie. <laughs> yeah, What's next? What? What's next? You know, go find yourself. Go go figure it out. And, uh, you know, I think that's been a big journey of mine for the last 30 years. You know, who am I aside from my parents? Who am I aside from uh, the film industry? Who am I aside from my friends? You know, and I think, you know, I faced that then. And, you know, I think we all faced it through COVID. And, mm-hmm. You know, here we are. So not much has changed. <laughs> well, and then, yeah, in the course of finding yourself, you dance around a lot and eight years later here comes charmed and you're cast as leo wyatt were were you like first choice for that how what was the casting for that like you know i don't know i i had done yes after sleepwalkers i had done a couple different things up and down i did uh i had done and it uh four tv movie two four two hour tv movies uh which they you know so four of them. We and I was in North Carolina forever, working with uh, Brian Bloom and and uh, David and Stan Barrett, who are these huge stuntmen and now producers, uh, directors. And anyway, that was like, oh, where's my career going? Right? I met my future wife. She moved out here. Got married. Had a baby. And I was like, you know, I'm not working, and I need to do something. Like. You know, now I'm working, I'm driving a pie truck, I'm doing construction, I'm I'm doing whatever I can just to be an actor. And it's funny, you know, I said to her, I was like, you know, I think I got to go back to school, like, or something. Like, this is, this isn't sustainable, working in a restaurant and, you know, making a hundred bucks a day. Like, and she was like, well, whatever you're going to do, just fucking do it. And I was like... No, you're supposed to tell me you're great and give me a hug and, you know, I'm an actor. Where's man. my like, support? Like, yeah, where's my support? It forced me to look at myself. I was pissed and upset and whatever. But ultimately, I looked at myself and said, all right, what am I doing? I haven't made a goal in, you know, 10 years. So I said, all right, I need to let's start over. You know, if I got to do a soap, whatever it is, I got to get my goal is to get on a television show. So get on there as a recurring, become a regular, however it works, that's the goal. And started going to the gym and doing whatever it did. Wound up doing a soap for six months, another world. Moved across the country, moved back, and, and then it, nothing's happening. So when the audition came for Charmed, I was actually doing some electrical work. I was under a house, you know, in Los Feliz. And he was like, oh, can you be over here at noon? I'm like, no, like half the work day how am I going to tell my wife I'm only bringing home 50 bucks like God, who's it for a spelling he never hires me like you know, <laughs> was that cool thing. and so I was like okay I'll go in I'll be back in an hour maybe I can make my money today I go in they're like hey okay great can you come back at four o'clock I'm like oh shit so I text my buddy I paged him and called him and uh, I was like dude I'm not making it back they want me to come back at four it's like, oh, I'm like, don't tell me why, please. Like, I'll let her know. Just, just don't get me in trouble, right? <laughs> just keep this one to yourself. Yeah, I'll see you tomorrow morning, bro. <laughs> like, and then boom. And so I had gone in for Aaron fifty times for nine hundred two one zero Melrose Place, a bunch of other things, and never, never, never got the role. And so my deal was to, I'm going to go in there, and I, and Aaron had this casting couch, which is. His office was 5,000 square feet, and he had a couch that would fit 30 people. And he'd sit right in the middle, and you sit on the, you stand on the other side of the room facing, it was the most terrifying audition room in the planet. And it was you walk in and stand up there and go, and, and I was like, okay, when I come in, I'm going to say hello, everybody, hello. Hello, Mr. It, I'm going to tell the spelling, it's good to see him again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe that way he'll remember, oh, Brian, right? So they bring me in. Oh, hello, Mr. Spelling. It's great to see you again. And he looks down at his paper and he's like, oh, uh, someone's like, oh, Brian. Oh, hi, Brian. It's nice to, <laughs> it's nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet me? Nice to fucking meet me? <laughs> now, I, my whole life is bubbling right now, right? I didn't make my hundred bucks for the day. My wife's going to kick my ass. I, I don't have an acting job. I'm struggling. I got a two-year-old at home. 
nice to meet me. <laughs> so, do you have any questions? You want to go through this audition? I'm like, no, I don't have any questions. Let's go. <laughs> like, okay. And I just, and I'm like, you know what? Fuck this. Fuck it all. Fuck you. Fuck me. Fuck him. Fuck him. Fuck me. Right? And I read the role. Unlike I had the two previous times earlier that day, I was like, yeah, ready, go. Okay, yeah, yeah, Charm, Phoebe, yeah, power three, yeah, that'll set you free. All right, fuck off. Okay, ready, uh, that's it. Any, anything else? And they're like, no, that's it. I'm like, okay, great, thank you very much. And I walked out. And they called me in 45 minutes and said I got it. So, <laughs> I, uh, you know, I've been confused ever since. How do I do <laughs> I think he was too. I mean, I just, I, you know, there's this idea in life, especially in acting, you know, when, when you want something too much, it shows and it comes across as desperate. And and this is something actors fight all the time. You know, you want this job, you're going to sink your teeth into it. And, And that, that amount of want sometimes stops you from just being, you know, and being okay with the result, whether it works out or whether it doesn't, you know, and it's like a girl, you chase a girl or a guy and, you know, when you, when you tell them you like them too much, they're like, Hey, whoa, yeah, back you, off, back off. Yeah. So it, it's kind of this, you know, letting go perhaps, uh, you know, not worrying about the end result. And, uh, <laughs> but then I do that and they're like, God, does he care at all? <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, I can't explain that one. Um, I had gone in for another role on the show and uh, for Andy, uh, Shannon Doherty's uh, Andy, Detective Andy. But, you know, I, I always I felt I was too young for that anyway to play a detective in my you know, mid-20s or 30s. Well, I mean, you were a handyman. Now you're playing a handyman. So kind of works out. It worked. It was funny. And I saw these guys with, you know, their tool belts on and... Like, man, never do props. Two tractors out there, don't do props. Don't don't wear the tool belt into the you know audition. I've heard some people do it, different things, and it works. But just don't do it. Just just. And I was like, ah, oh, no, okay, good. I was like, yeah. I'm like, mine's dirty in the car. You look at look at yours. It's so pretty. <laughs> <laughs> like, hey, that's a new one. <laughs> yeah, that's a new one. <laughs> like, huh. So you take it back. You don't. Know? After playing Leo for 140 plus episodes and developing this character and continuing his uh, story arc, how hard has it been to like separate Brian from Leo, like in the public eye and almost with yourself? I mean, this was your life for God, almost a decade. Yeah. uh, Eight years. Um, (laughs) You know, there's nothing really I can say bad about Leo at all. I mean, eight years, it, it changed my life. Um, you know, syndication, mm-hmm. all of that, traveling the world, comic cons, the amount of people I've met, the amount of job offers I've gotten since then, uh, to be the dad, to be the nice guy, to be that, um, is incredible. Uh, now, is there a bit of typecasting that's gone with it? I am Leo. I'm Mia. Uh, I just dinner tonight. This I, young girl too, twenty early twenties. She's like, oh my god, Leo! I'm like, fuck! I'm like, no! Don't you see my goatee? <laughs> like, I'm a tough guy now. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Oh my god, Leo's my favorite. There's something about our show uh, that reaches an audience, all ages too. And this is why it's still on. It's it's. You know, the, the message from our show was you can be anything you want to be. And, you know, your family is who you make it. Mm-hmm. And it's okay to be different. And, you know, if you're different, you actually have superpowers. And you you can be anything you want. And if you believe in good, you can you can trounce the evil in life. And, you know, you make your, your family is who you make it. And it really, ident- a lot of people identify with it. And... And, you know, I don't ever want to not be Leo. And if they made another show, of course I would go back as Leo. Uh, but has that prevented or been a hindrance, a hurdle to get over to do 
other jobs, uh, yeah, I, I think there's a lot of times cast characters are like, no, we know Brian, like, he's, you know, he's, he's not funny, he's, he's that, he's, he's the nice guy, he's the, this he's guy. He's the straight he's, guy. He's, he's Leo. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, you know, Holly Holmes is like, just fucking embrace it. <laughs> and I'm like, no, I want to play bad guys, like, <laughs> Guy, put me on the motor, you know. And it's like, oh, maybe, you know. It's a funny thing in this industry because generally, as an actor, you don't pick what you audition for. You don't pick your job, uh, you know, unless you're a superstar. You're auditioning, you know. Other people are choosing you, uh, so unless you turn down a lot of jobs, you don't generally choose your career path. Right, you're going to get hired for how people want to hire you, uh, for the most part, unless you have huge agents that are, you know, kind of guiding it. And it's rare for something like that. Most actors are your. It's what you got to audition for. You know, I, I know you had Corin Nemec on uh, mm-hmm. recently, and you know, Corin and I used to go in for a lot of the same stuff when we were young. Then he got Parker. I went this way. He went this way. Now, I don't even know that we go in for a lot of the same stuff, you know, because he's kind of, oh, you're Corin, you do this, you do this. Oh, you're Brian, you do this. And, you know, I, I don't know if it's producers or casting people that, you know, you're going to hire people for what you've seen them do before. You know, you wrote the script with this character you had in mind, right? Yeah. You know, you don't write the, you know, nice father that's sweet and loving for you know, Robert De Niro. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right? You know what I mean? You don't make the rock oh, yeah. the nerd. You know? You give the guy a gun and let him show his muscles. Yeah. Right? It's, so so I understand it from a filmmaking standpoint, but it, it can it can be a little frustrating. And, you know, again, as an a, you're, I'm an actor. So it's all you can do is go forward and lay down the best audition you can. And, you know, hopefully someone gives you the chance to break through another direction or you know at least like for me you know yes i was blue lagoon i was richard i was then i was you know charles brady this guy then now i'm leo and so you know the amount of projects i've done since then um since charm is plentiful and a lot of different characters um you know just nothing's hit and stuck yet for you know what is my next brand of whatever i guess but you know, for me, as long as I keep working, that's what it's all about for me. I, I just love acting. So, Well, um, and yeah, I mean, even as evil Leo, you weren't that <laughs> evil. I mean... I had spiky hair and a goatee. Like, it's evil. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I always loved the, like, water... It was more like emo Leo than <laughs> evil Leo. <laughs> It's true. I did have leather pants. Yeah, yeah. It was. <laughs> it was, you know. And again, you're you're back in that like heartthrob scenario where you're the male eye candy on the show, and you're yeah. like that that that's your claim to fame. You, you're the male heartthrob. <laughs> I I don't get it. I just you know it's. I tell you, it's a hard thing to think about because I don't see myself that way. You know, uh, I wasn't that growing up at all. You know, I was the guy that was picked on, the nerd, the, you know, they called me mouse. You know, I was, I was, you know, kind of thrown to the side. You know, I, I, I never became that, the stud. Well, there you uh, go. We'll start a show together, the Mouse and Moose podcast. Mouse and Moose, baby. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, so it's weird to hear that and, and know, like on television, when I audition, when I go in for things, it's like, oh, they want you to just, you know, just go be pretty. And it's like, well, I, and so I see myself more as a character actor than the leading guy, you know, in a way. Oh, um, played a lot of characters. Played a lot of characters, but it's, you know, they don't hire you to be the character guy when, you know, I guess you have this hair and my tiny nose. Well, and one of the characters I want to talk about, and you know, jumping forward from Charmed, is uh, Officer Martin from uh, Kikui, the Boogeyman. Oh uh, yeah, that was fun to watch the movie and your role in it because it was 
this like really serious role, you know, and especially if, you know, watching it as a fan of Charmed, you're watching, you know, as you just said, Leo is you, you know, watching you in this role of like a non-believer in the supernatural and the paranormal, it's such, it's yeah. such a departure. Listeners, if you haven't watched it yet, it's this movie, you know, these kids are coming up missing in town and it's the Mexican boogeyman is taking these kids and Brian's character is the uh, local police chief and he's trying to find out what's going on with the kids and does not believe in the boogeyman, which now yeah. after talking to you on the personal level with where you sit on the horror takes that up another step because <laughs> True. I totally see you as somebody who would check under the bed at night looking for the boogeyman. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what was swimming on that? Like, cause I mean, th this was, you know, a su I mean, this is like a super serious role. Yeah. Uh, you know, kind of came about, an offer for some friends that I worked with, whatever, and you know, it was it was like, hey, you're just doing a few days on it. Uh, you know, they spent a, a month or so shooting, and I think I only did like four days, five days. Uh, so I wasn't there often. It was coming and do it, and you know, working with Marisol Nichols, who's awesome, Riverdale, yeah, full, stunning, wonderful human being. Uh, you know, so that was, it, it was different because you're right. It was like, okay, I'm this guy who doesn't believe in the supernatural. <laughs> like, it's funny, like, you know, in Sleepwalkers, there was Ernie Lively who played our, uh, the dog catcher, the cat catcher. Yeah. Comes up like, where are got your cat? And I kind of felt like, man, this is me playing. <laughs> you went full later, circle. Like, I don't believe you kids. Yeah. Like, you know, like. Well, I'm that character. And so for me, it was a chance to kind of play. The movie didn't fall on me. You know, it's I'm not the lead of it. Yeah. I, you know, I'm kind of the supporting, you know, storyline. And uh, I like that because then I can kind of just come in and, you know, I'm not there for the whole emotional roller coaster of it. You know, that kind of fell on girls. So, you know, to come in on a spot like that and just. You know, you're a closed minded this is it. You have this is how you're gonna think the whole movie until you die, you know, basically. Like, so. This is the box you're in, stay in this box. Yeah. You kids are crazy <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, I and, yeah, I mean you you definitely uh nailed it because you, okay. you you came across as you know, that very stark non-believer, you know, there, there has to be a rational explanation. You know, th this, you're talking about a boogeyman, a, a, a folk story, you know, that right. th there has to be something else happening to these kids. No, it, this is what's happening. You know, so it was, was definitely yeah. fun to watch. Thanks. Yeah. You know, and, and watching guys like, like in sleep with Ron Perlman, you know, kind of played that same role, uh, Mark Hamill kind of played that same role in the beginning of the movie and, you know, and then Ernie and, you know, seeing so many great actors over the years play this, you know, this is horror, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, you kids are crazy. That's not happening. Go, I'll walk into that house myself. <laughs> you know? Famous last words. I mean, right? I mean, well, fine. You guys are ridiculous. There's no such thing as... <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's it's got its spot in in horror, in thrillers. Uh, you know, and that, I think that character's very important in the storyline mm -hmm. of you know these movies. Um, so it's 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 fun, a fun part to play. And, and then again, the whole transition, emotional transition, doesn't fall on you as an actor. You you, you know what you're doing. You're coming in and going, "You're crazy." <laughs> it's like, yeah, you, you're here to help drive the story forward but more as an antagonist right because your hero then is like there's nobody on our side who do we turn to we've got to do it ourselves mm -hmm. right yeah it's the uh you, you're the 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 cause for these girls to you know rally and go take this thing on because well no one believes us 
And yeah. this thing has to be stopped before someone else gets hurt. So I guess it's on us. Well, like, and there was even a line, like, you know, because you played the girl's uncle. Why don't you call your uncle? He's, I did. He hung up on me. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. I played this in a, a Lifetime movie called Secrets in the Water. It's the same thing. I'm the sheriff. Uh, this kid was killed. This thing. And all, everybody, the girls are thinking, oh, it's got to be this, 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 or this person, this person. And I'm the sheriff, and I'm like, no, you girls have no idea, you know. All investigating. There's a, there's a reason for this, and it's not what you think. And so, yeah, then they have the scene like, well, we can't, we got to do this without the sheriff. And we need to go, you know. And so then they go off to kind of solve the crime, you know, coming back at the end with a little bit of an I told you so, you know. And it's, instead of dying, they got the I told you so. We never needed you, Sheriff. If we did this on our own. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Let's take a break from on-screen roles and switch over to one of your current projects, and that's House of Halliwell. You have a podcast. We have a pod. We started a podcast this year. Uh, Holly Marie Combs, Drew Fowler, and myself. Who, yeah, if you haven't watched so Holly was uh, Piper on Charmed. Uh, played my wife. Uh, Drew Fowler played our uh, youngest son back from the future as an adult. Uh, so it's it's on, a whole family affair. It's a family affair. Uh, the three of us on there. So we're doing a rewatch. Started with episode one. We're going through the episodes, rewatching it. Talking about it, things we remember, uh, you know, anecdotal. We've had quite a few guests on already, other people from the show and writers, directors, that type of thing. And it's it's fun. It's it's a uh, it's a walk down memory lane. Uh, it's you know, I don't always love opening up the box to the past. Uh, you know, I went through so much in those eight years from you know divorce and addiction and you know all of it to. Uh, you know, it's hard for me to even remember the shows. <laughs> you know, <laughs> going back and rewatching it is is interesting for me. Uh, but it's fun. I I love Holly so much and Drew, and they're just they become dear friends uh, of mine. And you know, we've been able to travel the world and do comic cons, and it's kind of how we we came about it. You know, we were doing a panels at these different cons, and we really got a good turnout. People loved kind of our banter. Uh, you know, we just kind of go off script and the wheels fall off and, you know, next thing you know, we're talking, who knows what we're going to talk about. Um, so there's a lot of that, uh, mm -hmm. on the podcast, of us just, you know, going way off topic. <laughs> so, well, that, that's what makes the rewatch, uh, series fun. I have one with a friend of mine and, uh, Michael B. Moynihan from Zoobly Zoo. And we go over the episodes of Zoobly Zoo show from a kids show from the eighties, and our we have a lot of fun when we kind of derail and we just start BSing about a lot of the things that just just random stuff, you right. know. And then getting back on track is you know the the, the hard <laughs> yeah. part, but sure. you know it, it's it, it definitely makes for a fun episode, and. It's been fun. I, I think we've done well. We've got a decent fan base so far. Um, so I know I subscribe. Oh, you did? Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. I don't even know what to think. I mean, to think that people would even want to listen to me podcast is, you know. So I remember when the teaser announcement dropped. I don't, I think I saw it on, is it either Facebook or Twitter? It had to be Twitter because I think Holly shared it on Twitter. Right. And I was like, what's this? And then it was you guys cutting essentially a promo and you're just kind of going off the rails. And I'm like, you know what? I don't even care. I'm fucking in. <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> That's funny. And I've been in ever since. Oh man. Awesome. Thank you. My wife listens to it cause she's a huge charmed fan. So it's, she doesn't uh, even listen to my show. So <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> well, I you know I don't do podcasts at all. So when Drew came to me and he's like, "Hey, we're gonna podcast," I'm like, "What? What is? What does that even mean? Like, what are we doing? Like, of course I know, you know, uh, what's his name? Uh, Rogan. Rogan. Of course, everybody's heard that, but uh, you know, it, I had no idea how many podcasts there were in the world. 
about pick a topic. Yeah. Holy crap. Well, and there there was a huge boom during COVID because, well, people couldn't leave. So sure. needed to find something to fill their time. Yeah, you want to learn how to woodwork? I got a podcast for you. Yeah. Yeah. I came across one the other day. It was, here's how you file taxes if you are a charity business. It's like, you know, that is a very specific podcast. Yeah. I'm not going to listen to it because I feel like I would probably go to sleep. But it's a very specific audience here. Yeah. You know, just, yeah, the, the, the world of podcasting has grown exponentially in the last couple of years. It certainly has. Uh, so, Drew would come, you know, hey, we're going to try this. And I'm like, you know, I'll, all right. I mean, you know, for me, it was a really interesting time, Charm. You know, I got divorced. But my, again, I had set a goal, get on a show. I got on a show. Um, you know, everything, me and my wife, we got out of debt. We could buy a house now. And, you know, then she won't get into the details, but didn't want to stay on the West Coast. And her mom was sick. She wanted to go back East. And that led to time apart, led to, you know, our relationship growing apart. And uh, I was devastated. You know, my son moved away and, you know, I became a heavy drinker. And, you know, I was basically sad for 10 years, you know, as my kid lived away. So I, I didn't really appreciate as much as I think I could have, you know, that whole experience, uh, I was pretty much kind of like where I was from the audition. I was like, you know, fuck this shit. So it you, went away, you didn't really have a chance to away. take it all in. and Yeah, I didn't care if it went away. I, I wanted to be with my son, and um, I wasn't. So it was, you know, show up, do the work, take the money, see my son during the summer and holidays, and, you know, deal with it. And I'd go home and, you know, drink myself to sleep and get up and do it again, get up and do it again. And, and so, you know, to go back in a podcast and, and talk about where I was um, isn't easy, uh, but, you know, I'm four and a half, almost five years sober, and, you know, I've done a lot of work on myself and accepting and forgiving and, you know, all that. Shit. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I was like, you know what? Yeah, I'm an open book. Let's talk about it. Great. You want to you scrape my wounds? Come on. <laughs> you know, it, it's hard sometimes when we talk about, you know, where we were and, you know, at this time in our life. But, you know, I think part of that's also, you know, it's what I have to offer. Um, you know, so many people think, oh, you're on a TV show playing Leo, getting paid gobs of money. Like, uh, don't tell me you were depressed. Fuck off. Right. And it's like, I get it. You know, I, I get it. I was, I think the same thing about athletes and other, I mean, it's just our, you know, it's, it's like human all, nature. It's, it's human nature. You're doing all these great things. It's like you look you, like you have a fantastic life. How can, <laughs> how can your life suck? Well, it fucking does. And I have a job to do. You know, money doesn't change anything when it comes to emotions. And that's, that's just the thing. And, and so I would just be like, throw it away. Who cares? But it, none of this matters. Being on a show doesn't matter, right? I, I wanted to be with my kid and I couldn't. And, uh, you know, I made it extra miserable for myself. Um, you know, and I don't know that that came across on screen, but, you know, that, those were my weekends. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting going back in the podcast and digging it up and, um, you know, I think that was a big question for myself. Like, am I ready to open up this, you know, and of course you don't have to be, you can be as personable or not and honest as yeah. you want on the air, but you know, it's very hard for myself to not be kind of an open book. Um, and, and I think addiction is a huge problem in our country as it is and depression. And, you know, if, if just hearing any piece of my story helps somebody, you know, find a path that helps them, then, you know, I'm not going to deny that opportunity. And, and so that was, that was kind of the, you know what? Yeah, let's go for this. Let's, let's, I, I think I have a little bit something to say and I, I'm not an expert on it or anything. I'm just another guy that went through it. And here we are sitting on the good side of it. Right. Well, and now that raises a question that I, I wasn't even going to get into because I, I didn't know all the backstory, but given your emotional state and everything that you were going through, you know, you wanted to spend time with your son and, you know, you, you were depressed and you just had, you know, you, you were in that like zero fucks given mode. Let's go to 
I'd say the later half of uh, Charmed after Piper and Leo have their first son and he's supposed to, you know, he's basically he's supposed to be the, the bringer of evil or whatever. And he gets kidnapped and Leo loses his shit. Like how much was acting and how much is that you actually coming across what you were going through on screen? I mean, you know, I know that the, the as the writers got to know all of us, they wrote more for us, right? Uh, and that's just good writing on any show. Yeah. You, you kind of write for your character, your actor, not even for your character. Um, so I think a lot of our producers and writers, they, they, they could see me. Um, of course, nobody comes and talks to you. Hey, mm-hmm. you all right? Hey, you know, hey, man, like, you need a hug? What's up? You know, you, We're just going to make some money off of this. Yeah, they're, they're like, no, 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 let's, let's write it in for them. <laughs> like, yeah, this would be good TV. <laughs> so I, I, it's hard to say. Um, you know, I never stopped being a professional, showed up prepared, memorized. Every day I, I showed up, I, you know, didn't need my sides, word for word, let's go. And, and that's the name of the game, and be in the moment and always give to the other actor. And, and that's something I'll always do. Uh, so... You know, yeah, when when you write scenes like that and I lose it and, you know, we're destroying everything, um, yeah, I, I, I mean, the attic kind of looked like my house after, you know, a long weekend, <laughs> like, you know, I, what are you going to say? Um, I don't know that I ever totally brought myself into it as much as, uh, you know, I, I would get into a thing where I guard myself. Mm-hmm. You know, if, if you show too much emotion or too much of who you are, how do you divide that from yourself? Yeah. And and I, and I think that's hurt some of my performances, honestly, uh, of not giving enough, not being truthful enough, not being hurt enough, not, not being affected enough as a real person uh, to let that come through. Uh, you know, there's, there's always been kind of a wall. Let me act it as opposed to feel it. Um, and, and so I, I felt like sometimes there was it was me acting as opposed to, you know, if I really feel this, you're going to, who knows what you're going to get. And I yeah. don't want to show that. And so that's part of my fear as an actor as well sometimes and something I have to get over. And, you know, definitely being on stage helped, uh, you know, and just feeling like you're in a safe environment. And that was something that Holly and Alyssa and Rose and Shannon always created for fellow actors was... For us, anyway, the, you know, our core was, you know, a, a place to feel safe emotionally. So, if, you know, if, like Holly, who cried for eight years, you know, she needed to feel like she could cry. You know, it's not every set you can step on uh, where you're going to feel comfortable with your crew, with your other actors, you know, and feel so emotionally available and yeah. vulnerable. Um, you know, you know, and that was something that they definitely said, but. You know, it was interesting. The day I got married on the show was the day I got served papers. I literally got served papers in the parking lot. Holy and shit. Walked on the set in my tuxedo. <laughs> Action! I do. I love so much, Piper. I love how marriage is the best. <laughs> Holy fuck. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so that was that was cheap today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, wow. Yeah, I know. My, my, come on, you don't have to serve me at work, really. That, that's insane. Play. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I get you serve people where you know they're going to be at, but I mean, come on. Come on, come on. I was at home all day yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> it's like yeah. I'm at work. I'm at home. Pick yeah. home. <laughs> <laughs> Looking ahead, what projects do you have coming down the uh, pike? Well, I did a movie called Demonologist uh, with Jay Steli. He wrote, directed, uh, had to be three, four years ago. Small little indie horror, $100,000 movie, and I play, I'm the devil. Uh, I am the devil. I am the demonologist. I'm the man. And uh, it's Dane Rhodes and myself. Dane is an incredible character actor. He's been in a million films. 
uh, and it's uh, it's the demonologist. It's kind of it's almost. I know Stelly wrote it where the, the demonologist could be a TV show or you know many many movies, and it's kind of like the the first. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's me becoming the demonologist. So um, it's kind of like you know first zombie kind of thing, but mm-hmm. the devil. Um, it's interesting. So that'll actually be on demand finally uh, this January 1st, Demonologist. Uh, I just finished a movie with Orn Nemec uh, called Word to Death. Uh, Kelly Sullivan, the star of that. And uh, I play a kind of a Keith, oh, like kind of like a Dateline reporter uh, who's a cross between Geraldo and Nancy Grace and... <laughs> Keith Morrison. <laughs> like so you're an asshole? Movies. Yes. I watch so many of these real true crime shows, like these Forensic Files, Dateline, Snap. Like, I watch them all. So I love this role and what Corin wrote. Corin's a great writer. Uh, is that I'm, you know, I'm interviewing. I'm the interviewer. So January 23rd, you, you know, <laughs> I think this is a thing. And so blah, 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 blah. And then, you know, in the next scene, I'm interviewing this woman and I'm like, you know, I'm full Nancy Grace on her. Like, well, you said this, and you did that, and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> you know, and then towards the end, I'm a little Geraldo, you know. Well, this is where it's at. And, you know, I was I got to play kind of all my favorite, you know, forensic file <laughs> characters in one movie. Um, so I'm not sure when that's out. We just finished this year, and they're still in the edit of it. Uh, we'll, we'll see when that comes out. Uh so I don't remember, but I think he said something about it in his episode. So go back and listen to Corin's episode and listen for that conversation. Yeah, work to death. I, I'm sure it'll be spring sometime this year. Uh, I think but so. But that was so much fun to play. Uh, I, yeah, Keith Morrison meets Nancy Grace. <laughs> <laughs> uh, besides that, it's 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 writing. Uh, you know, I'm trying to turn out a script myself, a uh, bit of a thriller or um, a little more on the thriller side, I suppose. Um, you know, writing for me is not easy. Uh, I've been a part of a lot of great thrillers and horrors that, you know, have not gone on to do, you know, excellent. Uh, you know, you turn them out, you make them for a couple hundred thousand, they become, you know, they're in the auxiliary market of of the world, you know, mm-hmm. they don't make it in the theaters, you know, not, not a, but man, some great characters and scripts that I've seen people turn out. Um, so, you know, I have a lot to go off of as far as uh, structure and storylines and this, and it's, I tell you what, writing's not easy. No. <laughs> I'm a great story guy. <laughs> like, okay, good, these two guys, we got the thing, and then, yeah. Oh, 100%. I can tell you a story all day long, yeah, oh, yeah. but putting it down on paper and making it a cohesive beginning, middle, end, and make it interesting, oh, that's rough. It's tough. It's it's not easy. Hats off to everybody that finishes it, and, you know, whether that's a, a dime store movie you made in your backyard to the biggest. It's, it's, I've uh, been writing one for, I think, two and a half years now. So, wow. <laughs> you get it, you get it. Yeah, it's like, you know, you just, you, you know what you want, but then when you get to actually writing it, you're just like, well, that's not how it sounds. I know. Crap. Should I start over? Delete, 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 delete. Uh... They say, just keep going. Just don't stop. Just work it through. And it, it's, hard, it's hard for me. I, I mean, I'm, I'm all over the place and I'd rather go do this or go do that mm-hmm. or go do that. You know, I'm going to take this break and and hopefully turn something out, you know, before the new year and have something to go pitch. Um, That, the podcast, audition. Oh, yeah. It's to be the life. So where can listeners follow you on social media and keep up to date with everything you have coming out? Uh, Well, uh, the House of Halliwell is a great way, the podcast. Get it where you get your podcast. Um, Social media, I am on Facebook-ish. I'm Brian Krause 21 uh, on Instagram. Uh, and that's, I don't post often or about, I'm a horrible self promoter. The it worst. It took me a while. It's okay. Bought off the of Twitter like years ago. Like, I'm, I just, 
social media bothers me and you know to be in control of my own self promotion i just you know it just feels very like look at me look at me look at me look at me i just can't do it i say there's a very fine line with you know you have to promote this but are you promoting it too much are you promoting it too little and yeah. you, you tend to get self-conscious about it because it's like, I don't want to push it too much because then I feel like, hey, you have to look at me. Look at what I'm doing. But right. if I don't promote it, people don't know what I'm doing. And then I'm going to feel like crap because no one is getting eyes on what I'm doing. So it's right. it, it's a really weird line to walk. It is weird, you know, especially with social media because, you know, I have a friends that are friends. And then I have... You know, fans that follow me, of course, and, and then, you know, other producers, other directors, other actors, people who I consider my peers. And it's a weird thing because I go on as me, but then I also have to go on that same site as my persona of Brian Krause. So I'm Brian Krause and I'm Brian Krause, <laughs> you know, Mouse, you know, so it's, you know... It's a weird thing. We both all on one social media site. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, do I just say forgo being the real me and go make a burner account where I tell all my buddies it's Bob Smith and they follow Bob Smith. How fun is that? That's how fun is that? That's not fun. <laughs> like, hey, what's up, Bob? Like, I mean, what are you doing? I'm talking to my 12 people at now. Like, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's a fine line, and I, I, I don't know. I'm just, I've never been a good self promoter. Um, you know, ever since I was a kid, I, I was very much, I needed all the attention from my mom and my man and the sports. And look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. Uh, you know, this is why I'm an actor, okay? <laughs> Here I am, Dad. You know? I want attention, give it to me now. Be proud of me. <laughs> So I've kind of grown out of a lot of that and, and you know, to go promote myself is, I, I feel, I don't know what I feel. It's hard to say. Like, I feel guilty. I feel like a schmoozy. Sh and I don't look at people that way that do it, but it's how I feel. And I don't know how to get over it. And, and I kind of need advice on it. Like, what, you know. Well, if you figure it, it out, let me know. Man, it just put it in its place and do it. You know, I, I guess the best advice is nobody's thinking about you. Everybody's thinking about themselves. You're the only one thinking about what other people are thinking about you. They're not actually thinking about you. You know what I mean? You yeah. walk into a bar or thing and you're like, oh my God, everybody's going to hate my hair. Nobody's thinking about your hair. <laughs> you know what I mean? They're thinking about their own life. You know, we all do that. We all are only thinking about ourselves really. Oh, yeah. You know? go in with some big yellow shoes with green polka dots on it. Somebody might see them and go, oh, okay. They clock it, but they're not going to sit there and judge you for an hour for it. No, exactly. They're in their own head about their own thing, right? They're worried so about I their guess, own yellow shoes. That's right. So I, I guess that helps me step over into being a better promoter, but don't go to my Instagram expecting to see much. <laughs> <laughs> Listeners, I will post the links to those in the episode description for easy access. And you can find me and other great podcasters over at electronicmediacollective.com. Or if you just want to see what I'm up to, head over to Facebook and Twitter at Moose Media Inc. Just look for the moose. Brian, this <laughs> has been very entertaining. And <laughs> we much like with Corin, barely scratched the surface of the things you've done. There's so much left on the table. <laughs> Thanks. I mean, you know, I, I, anytime I'd love to come back on and talk more. Uh, I, I know I, I tend to ramble. Uh, I'm 100% so down for it. I love the <laughs> stories. I love the sidetracks. It, it, it makes for fun listening. Yeah, and that, that's yeah, why I do want this. want to know more about different movies and things. I mean, obviously, there's been a lot of sci-fi stuff and Lifetime and small horror movies. And, you know, if people are into the making of and how did this happen definitely. and stuff, I'd love to come back on and talk about all of that. And so um, I definitely want to have you back on after uh, Demonologist comes out because I was looking at that in the credits list. And that is one I want to see and I really want to watch. So I... I 
after that one comes out, I definitely want to have you back I'd love on. To hear your opinions. You know, knowing going in, and you know, and maybe the whole audience won't watch it. A hundred and twenty thousand dollar movie. Like we didn't have nothing, and uh, we made it in eleven days. And you know how they turned it out, and the special effects, and what it became is. Uh, I mean, for an eleven day movie, it's it didn't. It's uh, you know. They put it out. Uh, so, well, I'd love to hear, you know, now, there's not many movies that you can make in 11 days. No. Especially, especially that one because we had so many different locations, so many special effects. Uh, it wasn't all in one room in one place. It was, we were bouncing around. Uh, and, you know, it was up to Steli to, you know, hey, you want this scene or don't you? You know, we're moving on. You get one shot. You want the wide shot, the medium shot, the tight shot? You want a tracking shot? How do you want to shoot this? But we, we got 20 minutes to get this page and a half. And so that was kind of, you know, as a film, you know, as a director, as a filmmaker, you know, that's the reality of making something really low budget is you, hey, what shot do you want? You know, you, you don't get all the coverage in the world to, you know, turn this thing out. How are you going to tell your story best when you got 20 minutes to get one shot at it? And oh, hopefully yeah. your actors don't mess up the lines. Like, yeah, let's go. Yeah, no, I'm I'm definitely looking forward to it. And you know, it, it, it's weird. Normally, I just have a thank you to do at the end of this, but I would be remiss if I didn't thank Corin. And Corin, if you're listening to this, I got I got to thank him for setting this up. I mean, uh, yeah. th- this is this has been phenomenal. And thank you for coming on and chatting with me. This is, like I said, very entertaining. And I'm looking forward to your next visit when we can dive deeper into some more of these movies. Uh, you know, it's great. I met Corin when I was doing Sleepwalkers. He was on the uh, Columbia lot doing Parker Lewis uh, at the same time. So we, we were on the, the studio lot uh, in 1980, 1991 together. Like, oh, what's up, bro? What's up, bro? Let's have a cigarette. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. And so I took over for a movie that he, when he broke his leg a few years back, he was in an accident, uh, and they needed somebody to take over, and they called me up, said, hey, can you be in Belize tomorrow? And I was like, okay. Sure. And so I flew down there, and Corn was in, I went and saw him at the hospital, and he had broken his femur. And then, oh, poor guy, had a few surgeries since, but Crazy. Uh, he's... He's a dear friend and so, so, so talented. Oh, very. Uh, I will watch him in, man, watching him play the rabbit in that oh, How good is he? In Rotten Tail? Oh, my God. I love Rotten Tail. Yes. He is so good. <laughs> <laughs> I told him that. And I'm like, dude, I love it. And he's like, well, well thanks. I'm like, no, do you realize, like, you were fucking the rabbit. Like, you were good. He's like, oh, <laughs> he could be a star for sure oh yeah I mean, and listeners watch for the demonologist in the next couple months and welcome to season 4 of Moose's Monster Mash until next time horror hounds mash on